Um, so I'm Judy Stern. I'm from UC Berkeley in Educational Technology Services. Um, ben talked a little bit about our organization yesterday. I am going to um, do a couple of things here. I'm going to kind of tell a short story about what we've been doing in terms of teaching and learning using video at Berkeley, specifically from the perspective of our organization and kind of the organizations that fed into it. Um, and then I'm going to kind of list out some of the tensions we've been experiencing. And I <coughs> hope that we would have time to discuss them, but I think probably that's going to have to happen offline. <coughs> um, so the story has a couple of plot lines or threads. Um, the first thread is the instructional technology thread. Um, throughout the 90s and kind of into this decade, we um, had an, te an instructional technology program. Um, primarily what we were doing, particularly in the case of video, was providing training and consulting. So we didn't have big production um, services. We didn't really even have small production services. Um, the context at the time, you probably all remember, it was a time when they were easy to use media authoring tools. HyperCard had been introduced in the late 80s, quick time in the early 90s. Um, our goal, roughly speaking, was to help instructors use technologies in ways that encourage active learning. Um, the outcomes that came um, that that came out of this were um, a bunch of multimedia projects for the most part CD-ROM based in the early 90s, web based um, as we got to the later 90s. Um, and of course, you know, one thing that we were able to do was provide greater access to video um, for the students in ways that they couldn't have access before. Um, we were able to introduce some degree of interaction to make it um, a little bit more interactive and there was some small examples of student created media, which is you know, where I think a lot of the power lies, but um, those were minimal. I think the challenges we were facing at the time and actually still face are the technology costs, and by that I mean not only, I mean in the early 90s a digitizing board was um, you know, $1,000 or more, but also the time in terms of how much time it was going to take an a instructor to invest in this stuff, to learn it, to remember it, you know, when they didn't come back to it for a few months. Um, as well, as I already mentioned, we didn't have the capability, the resources to provide services to really um, help them create the media. Um, so we were spending, in a, in a sense, more, more of our effort on technology than we were on pedagogy. And the other big challenge was a lack of scalability. So um, a lot of these projects were considered boutique projects. Um, <coughs> here's just, um, you know, I'm going to skip over this. This was a, um, a profile of one of the instructors, um, and it's just an exemplar of kind of the kind of work we were doing. Um, you know, the big issues were um, the cultural immersion that she felt that she could get from the video. Um, she did most of the work. Um, she took classes. Um, we provided um, guidance along the way, and that was was common in a lot of projects. Um, this is an example from um, an educational research project. Um, this was probably <coughs> mid-90s, um, nothing beautiful, but um, you know, URL flipping going on, um, interactive video where you could click and um, change where you were, um, captions. So we were trying to introduce um, ways to make the experience more active for students. The second thread that comes in is that um, in the second half of the 90s, there was an engineering research project, Ben mentioned it yesterday, coming out of the Berkeley Multimedia Research Center. Um, that was BIBS, uh, the Berkeley Internet Broadcasting System. Context here was um, real video coming out, having decent <coughs> web video options, in particular streaming. The goal of that project originally was to allow students to review material from a lecture anytime, anywhere. <coughs> um, there were some studies done, um, and they did find um, primarily by looking at usage statistics that students were primarily using it as a study tool. Um, more than half the students reported better understanding and they liked the self-paced learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the challenges there were some issues on the part of instructors. Some were concerned about attendance, students not going to their classes um, because the video was available. Um, in reality, that wasn't such a big deal. The biggest places where it was a concern was the 8 o'clock classes, not surprising. Um, and um, then there were some who didn't want to be webcast because they were concerned about intellectual property. Um, on the part of students, um, the students, not surprisingly, wanted the ability to get to specific content. Thing comes up again and again. This is just the interface from Bibbs at the time. 
Um, beginning of this decade, those threads started to come together. Um, so Bibs became um, Webcast Berkeley as it moved to our media services organization. Our media services organization merged with, merged with our instructional technology organization and became ETS. So that's the organization that me and my colleagues are part of now. So here we finally had, you know, these kind of two different threads. We're now, um, you know, different, still different groups, different staff, but we're all at least under the same umbrella. Um, we came even closer together um, between 2003 and 2005 when we adopted Sakai um, as an open source collaboration and learning environment. And at the same time, we added significant development resources um, because we were going to start building tools for Sakai. And in addition, we brought um, in an interaction designer who kind of introduced the user-centered design process to our organization. And so now we're at a point where we were saying, okay, so can we build a Sakai tool that will enable video to be used to improve teaching and learning? Um, a few words about user-centered design, and it's you know, a hard thing to talk about in a few years, few words, <laughs> need a few years. Um, so um, basically the focus is on the users and fully understanding the users and what their goals are and what they need to do before you even get to design, and I'll say a few words about some of the specific processes that we followed. Um, but a big part of understanding the user is understanding their pain points. So we did some initial research. Um, Obi helped me at the time with this. We went and talked with instructors. We did surveys. Um, and so this is a very high level, what, you know, what were the pain points? Well, for the instructors who were not the ones involved in the webcast program, their pain points were still the technical, you know, it's just too much work. It's burdensome to get that video up. The webcast um, instructors still had some concerns regarding attendance, and that was really the only thing that we saw repeated in terms of their problems. For students, um, they, um, one of the things that was repeated was they didn't have control over what they saw. The, the camera was on the student, I mean, excuse me, on the instructor when they really wanted it on the board or vice versa. They couldn't see the PowerPoints clearly, things like that. And then still, again, we find this repeated. They had difficulty finding specific content. Um, and when we looked at what these pain points were, we said, you know, we can't, in terms of building a tool, we can't address the instructor pain points terribly well. Um, and in terms of the student pain points, um, there were things that we could do when the organization has moved to um, doing a better job making sure the students could see what they wanted to see. But we were going to focus on this aspect of difficulty finding specific content. So from there, we created our problem statement, um, which was a very valuable thing to do, especially in terms of getting stakeholder buy-in, sponsor buy-in, um, and making sure everybody was on the same page. And basically what we said was that, you know, nothing mind-boggling, but you know, we have this problem where we have students who want to, um, who want to take an intentional approach to working with this video, to studying with it. Um, they have good techniques, you know, we watch students you know, work with text, they know how to highlight things, they know how to bookmark things, they can get back to them. Um, but video is so opaque, it's hard to get into the specific parts that you want. Our solution, and it's probably reminiscent of the projects we've seen already, are to provide tools that enable students to mark points in time in video and find points for purposes of review, reflection, study, and completing assignments. Um, and we didn't, at this point, say specifically what we were looking for. We had, you know, looked at a range of tools and, and had a sense that there wasn't anything specific we needed. So um, now we're at a point where we're saying, well, this problem of opaqueness is particularly acute for webcast students. You know, students using video all over the board are having problems with this opaqueness. But the students using our lecture webcasts were having a problem because it's really long form and they're you know, looking at them several times a week, and there's a lot of media there. And at the same time, we were talking about growing our webcast program. So, so now we're at this point where we say, okay, what we're doing is we're building tools for Sakai that will help students more actively use Webcast Berkeley as a study tool. Um, so just a little bit about the user-centered design process we went through. You know, once we had reached that point, we continued doing user research, um, really observing students as they were working with the webcast video, um, we tried to model what we had learned via personas and activity diagrams and moved on to requirements definition and got to the point um, where we had a conceptual framework design, which is really kind of a high level sketchy design, but it has all the components that we needed. Um, let me just 
just to show you one of the artifacts, and this is our primary persona, Lisa. Um, the idea with creating personas is to, um, to develop um, an archetype, somebody who can represent all the research that we've gathered, um, not a stereotype, that's a really important distinction, um, and somebody who, if we meet her needs, we're gonna be meeting the needs of others. So um, I guess I'm not gonna spend too much time with her, and this is a high level um, view of her anyways, but I can show anybody more later if they want. Um, so we had to stop at that point. Um, we didn't have the resources to continue to build the tool. That was about a year ago. Um, and so now I'm gonna kind of talk about some of the tensions, and the first one, um, is you know we have a strong desire in our department to improve teaching and learning with new tools, but we also really have to deal with maintaining our existing mission critical services. And so that's why um, we don't have resources put on this project, um, on the teaching and learning aspect of this project just yet. We're dealing with a lot of the infrastructure issues. Um, I'm gonna just go through these pretty quickly and if people wanna comment on them afterwards, um, they can. Um, what we're not doing um, with this kind of support for webcast is addressing um, or promoting any specific educational approaches. Um, we're building a more generalizable architecture. Um, one of the things that um, was a tension for me at the beginning and I'm kind of coming to terms with it, with, with it more um, with the, this whole concept of user-centered design, um, you're really looking to figure out how you can um, reduce work for the user, make them work less hard to get to their goal. Um, and if you're interested in active learning in a way, what you want students to do is work harder. You want them to you know, put the effort into reflecting, interacting with the material, et cetera. Um, and another way to say that is you know, sometimes the student goals are not the same as the instructor goals. So, um, and I put instructor in quotes um, because they're kind of all our goals. We all want the students to um, work harder. Um, some of the things that's come up for me a lot at this conference is how much information students can have um, and yet how little time they have to really access that material. And we know students these days are capable of an amazing amount of multitasking, but I still have concerns, you know, based on the research that we did that um, Lisa is not gonna spend a whole lot of time working with webcast because she wants to get off of webcast and go over to Facebook or Flickr or you know, what other, whatever other um, things that she wants to do with her personal time. Um, issues of shared sense making versus personal sense making. Um, uh, this top one, um, back to that whole issue of attendance. Well, if you have, um, if you're concerned with attendance issues, maybe you should be making your class more interactive, but once classes become far more interactive, then you have video that's far less useful in terms of watching it as, watching it as a lecture. Um, and related to that is meeting the needs of our students. So again, you know, if we want our classes to be more interactive, is it really gonna meet the needs of our worldwide audience in terms of being able to see what's going on in a classroom where there's lots of different um, things happening. Um, and I think I will just end with, um, this is a little bit long, this is from an article written by Charles Kearns from um, Stanford. Um, he wrote it in 2002 when he was the educational technology manager for the Open Knowledge Initiative at Stanford. Um, but it says a lot about you know, where we can be moving and I hope we move in this direction at the same time that we continue to um, really know what our users want and need. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>